In this video, I'm gonna directly compare three cinema cameras that each cost less than $1,000. Most cinema cameras you see nowadays cost between $2,000 and like $20,000, which is insanely out of reach for pretty much anybody. Unless you own, you know, a high-end video production company or won the lottery or something like that, most people, even freelance videographers, just can't afford these ridiculously expensive cinema cameras. However, I think there's countless amounts of awesome cameras you can get for under $1,000 that still record amazing looking video that people just don't know about or really don't consider options because of all these new cameras that are coming out. So in this video, I'm gonna be comparing three of these awesome cinema cameras that cost less than $1,000 each. I'm gonna be doing a very in-depth comparison to show example footage, show direct video comparisons, pretty much everything about these three cameras I'm gonna go really in depth in to give you the best possible comparison and really show you that these three cameras are great budget options for cinema cameras. And at the end, I'm gonna declare the king of the $1,000 cinema camera, as well as just give my recommendations for which one I'd recommend for which type of person. So definitely stay tuned for that and watch this entire video. It would really help me out as well. All right, so there's gonna be a bunch of different sections to this video. This took a ridiculous amount of time and effort and money to make this video. So I filmed this throughout multiple weeks, maybe even months. So it might kind of jump around a little bit. I apologize for that, but this took a lot of work and a lot of time to make this video. And so because of the amount of time, energy, and money it took to make this, it would really, really help me out if you could go down, hit the like button on this video, maybe leave a nice comment as well as subscribe to my channel. And of course, only do all that if you actually want to and if you enjoy this video, but definitely keep that in mind that it really, really helps out my channel. So all that would really help my channel a lot and I'd really appreciate it. But without further ado, let's get right into this video. All right, first things first, I'm gonna do an introduction of each of these three cameras. So I'll start off with the Canon C100. This camera was released in 2012 and it was Canon's entry level cinema camera at the time. It comes standard with a Canon EF mount. It shoots 1080p video at 24 and 30 frames per second. This camera has a 4K Super 35 sensor. However, it downscales it to 1080p. So hypothetically, this is gonna provide sharper 1080p than just a standard 1080p sensor. This has built-in ND filters at two, four, and six stops and then obviously clear. This camera comes with a rotating side grip which you can pretty much orient in any direction you need as well as a removable top handle with two XLR inputs. Next up, the Blackmagic Production Camera 4K. This camera was released in 2013 and it also has Canon's EF mount just like the C100, as well as a Super 35 sensor in this with a slightly higher crop factor, but we'll get into that a little bit later. However, this can shoot 4K video up to 30 frames per second. And this has a global shutter, which means there's gonna be less of a jello effect and overall it's gonna provide more natural looking images than other cameras with what's called a rolling shutter. This shoots 4K video up to 30 frames per second in pretty much any form of ProRes 422 video and also in Cinema DNG RAW, but we'll also get into that a little bit later in this video as well. This has no built-in ND filters and no top handles, side handles, grips, or anything like that. It's literally just this big chunk of metal. There's not even really a side grip on here to hold on to. There's really no good way to hold this camera. It's just pretty much, like I said, a block of metal. And that's it for the Blackmagic Production 4K. Last but not least, we have the Panasonic AF100. This camera was released in 2010, so it's the oldest out of these three. It has a micro four thirds mount, so it has a two times crop factor versus around 1.5 to 1.7 on those ones. This shoots 1080p video up to 60 frames per second. It also has built in ND filters, just like the C100 at clear and then two, four, and six stops, which is identical to the C100. And this has a removable, but it's not rotatable at all. Kind of like a camcorder style grip. So this is how you can hold it. There's really no other way to hold it, but just like this. So you can't really get low shots without bending your wrist. You can kind of hold it like this, but it's a little weird. It's not meant to hold like that. So you pretty much either have to hold it like this. And you can also remove the side grip if you want to make it a little more compact, which is nice. And then it has a semi-removable top handle you can pretty much remove from here to this part, um, but this whole back section is permanent on here, which means the two XLR inputs that this has as well, just like the C100, are pretty much permanently attached to the camera. So 
Removing the side handle doesn't really do too much for making it smaller. However, it is partially removable if you need to. And that's pretty much it for the main specs of this camera. All right, next up is price. So like usual, we'll start off with the Canon C100. So when this camera came out, it costed $5,000. However, you can pick this up used on eBay or local marketplaces or wherever you get stuff used from basically for around $800 to $1,000. And if you look really hard, you can sometimes find them for closer to $600. But a good safe price point would be about $800 to $1,000 for this camera. The Blackmagic Production 4K was actually the cheapest new at $3,000 when it came out in 2013. But now you can also find this one for around $800 to $1,000 used. And last but not least, the Panasonic AF100 was also $5,000 new, just like the C100. And now you can find this for closer to six dollars to $800 used. So this is gonna be the cheapest one to pick up used. I have noticed that these two are pretty much the hardest to find. There's really not many on eBay at one single time. C100 is pretty common on eBay. You know, with cameras like these, there is lots of deals to be had. You really just need to keep on the lookout for them. Now I'm gonna go over the video capabilities of these three cameras, which would be the dynamic range, the frame rates, resolutions, codecs, and that sort of thing. Also, I'm gonna read these off my phone because there's absolutely no way I would remember all these specs. So first off, with the Canon C100, this camera has a super 35 sensor, which is a 1.5 times crop factor. So for example, if you put a 20 millimeter lens on this camera, it would be a full frame equivalent of 30 millimeters. This camera shoots 1080p H.264 video, in 8-bit 420 and it can shoot that at 24 and 30 frames a second and 24 frames a second recording with this camera is 24 megabits per second the c100 has multiple customizable picture profiles including c-log and wide dynamic range as well as multiple more picture profiles to best fit your needs this camera has up to 12 stops of dynamic range and it records this video two sd cards and it has two sd card slots and having those dual slots is really nice for having double the amount of storage you can hot swap the card so if the first one fills up, it'll switch to the second, then you can put another one in, and basically just go back and forth, which is really nice. And the last but not least, the C100 has a base ISO, which is the ideal ISO for recording. This is essentially the standard ISO, and it's kind of what everything is tuned for, so it'll provide the best dynamic range, and hypothetically just the best performance overall. And this ISO is 850. Next up onto the Blackmagic production camera 4K. This camera has a super 35 sensor with a 1.7 times crop factor. So it's a similar sensor size to the C100, however, this is a little bit smaller and it's gonna have just a little bit of a higher crop factor at 1.7 versus 1.5 times. So on this camera, if you put a 20 millimeter lens on there, it would be a full frame equivalent of about 34 millimeters. So it would be about four millimeters longer than the exact same lens on this camera in terms of full frame equivalents. So that's something to keep in mind with this camera. Every lens that you put on it is gonna be cropped in just a little more than uh, the C100 camera and most other APS-C size cameras, which have a 1.5 times crop factor like the Sony A6000 series or any APS-C Canon cameras have about the same one 1.5 to 1.6 crop factor and the same with Fujifilm and Nikon's crop sensors so pretty much the standard is 1.5 to 1.6 and this is 1.7 so just slightly more cropped in on the equivalent lenses. This camera shoots 4K Ultra HD video at 24 and 30 frames per second in ProRes and this can do anything from ProRes Proxy to ProRes LT, ProRes 422 and then ProRes 422 HQ. However this can also shoot Cinema DNG raw video at 24 and 30 frames a second as well. However, this is at a slightly wider than Ultra HD aspect ratio at 4000 by 2160 when Ultra HD is 3840 by 2160. So it's just slightly wider video, which allows you room to kind of move it around back and forth in post if you do produce your videos in Ultra HD 4K, or if you do export in that resolution, it will just be slightly wider than 4K Ultra HD. Now on this camera, 24 frames a second in ProRes 422 HQ, which is what I shot my footage with, and it's the highest quality codec besides going to RAW. And it's typically what I use because it's still very, very high quality video. However, moving to RAW adds a bunch more stuff to your workflow, so I typically shoot ProRes 422 HQ. And recording that in 24 frames a second with this camera, records 707 megabits per second video. So this is 707 megabits per second compared to 24 megabits per second on the C100, so just keep that in mind. This records much higher bit rate and ProRes 422 is 422 10-bit video, and then the RAW is 12-bit video. So this will also capture a lot more colors, have 
much greater color depth than this camera, as well as a higher bit rate for color grading and color correcting. And to wrap things up with this camera, this has 12 stops of dynamic range, which is the same as the C100. It records to a two and a half inch SSD. So this doesn't use standard SD cards, it's actually a SATA SSD, like the exact same ones that go in computers. And there's just one slot for this. However, you can get one or even two terabyte SATA SSDs for very cheap. So if you just get a really high capacity SSD for this, it's still gonna hold quite a bit of footage, but keep in mind, this records a very high bitrate, so it's gonna use up a lot of storage. And then lastly, this has a base ISO of 400. And last but not least, onto the Panasonic AF100. This camera has a micro four thirds sensor with a two times crop factor. So if you put a 20 millimeter lens on here, that'll be a full frame equivalent of 40 millimeters, which is even more cropped in than this camera. So it kind of goes in line from least cropped at 1.5 times 1.7 times and then most cropped in at two times. So it's another thing to keep in mind when choosing your lenses for these cameras. This camera records 1080p video at 24 and 30 frames per second. And then you can also do a VFR or variable frame rate mode up to 60 frames a second, which essentially automatically slows the footage down for you and makes it slow motion file straight out of the camera. So it's not gonna be as usable as the standard video like recording 24 and 30. However, if you do need those dedicated slow motion shots, you can still get 1080p video up to 60 frames per second. Now this camera records an H.264 video in 4228 bit at like I said, 24 to 30 frames a second or VFR mode up to 60 frames per second. And you can also do that VFR mode and change it in one frame per second increments, which could be useful depending on your situation. And for this, if you're recording 1080p, 24 frames per second, it's gonna record that at 24 megabits per second, which is the same as the C100, which means it's also a lot lower than this camera does. And this camera has 10 stops of dynamic range, which is quite a bit lower than these other two cameras, most likely because this doesn't have any sort of log or raw formats or anything like that. When both of these can shoot in their film or a log format, which have higher dynamic range typically. This camera also records to standard SD cards and has a dual SD card slot just like the Canon C100. And then lastly, it has a base ISO of 320. And so speaking of the video specs, only one of these cameras can actually do any sort of slow motion, which is of course the AF100. It can do up to 60 frames per second. While these two in any format, no matter what you do, are limited to 30 frames per second max. So if you 100% need slow motion for what you do, this is gonna be your only option right here, which is the AF100. Next up, we have video assist features. So the C100 has focus peaking, a focus magnifier, zebras, a waveform, and then a fixed electronic viewfinder. So this has a good amount of stuff to really help you nail in your focus, your exposure, your composition, and pretty much everything you need to get a good looking video. I really can't think of anything else that I would like this camera to have that it doesn't have already in terms of video assist features. I use the focus magnifier all the time. I use peaking all the time with it. I use the zebras all the time as well. So pretty much everything this camera has are amazing for getting great exposure, great focus, and great composition with this camera. The Blackmagic Protection 4K has a few less features, so it has focus peaking, it has a focus magnifier, it has zebras, and then it has a histogram. So a similar features to this, however, this doesn't have an electronic viewfinder for really, you know, checking your composition in that way. You kind of have to rely just on the screen. So in bright conditions, of course, looking at a screen like that is gonna be more difficult than a viewfinder like in this camera, but pretty much all the other focus and exposure features are in this camera as well. And then the Panasonic AF100 has the least amount of these features. This has zebras and it has a waveform, however, it doesn't really have any more advanced features and that's pretty much all it has except of course it has an articulating electronic viewfinder right here which is really nice for getting your composition and you know helping you check your focus and everything like that and it's not fixed like the c100 you can move it up and down so depending on you know what position you're holding the camera and this is really nice for checking composition for checking focus and just getting a great shot with if you don't want to use the built-in screen so in my opinion i'd say overall the c100 is your best option in terms of video assist features with this camera coming in second and then the f100 coming in last place for that All right, next up is audio. Now you might notice this looks a little different. It's actually because I'm recording with all three of these cameras right now. And I'm also testing out the internal microphones on all three of these cameras. So the audio quality probably is not as good as it was in previous sections. I'm gonna kind of switch between all three of these cameras so you can see what the internal mics sound like on all three of these, as well as kind of what the footage looks like, you know, what the skin tones look like, the dynamic range, that sort of thing. So first things first, like usual, the Canon C100. The C100 has two XLR inputs, it has a headphone jack, a three and a half millimeter mic jack, and a bunch of physical buttons and dials for adjusting your audio settings like the gain and audio controls. And pretty much all this is packaged right in the top handle of this camera. And this is pretty much what this camera has in terms of audio inputs. 
Of course, it provides phantom power, so your XLR microphones are going to have really good clean audio. And then that 3.5mm mic input on the body is pretty good if you're flying this on a gimbal and you want to take the top handle off but still want some sort of decent audio that's better than what you're hearing right now. The 3.5mm mic input comes in handy for using like a Rode Wireless Go or a Rode Video Micro or something like that. But of course, that's not going to be as good of quality as the XLR inputs on this camera. Next up, the Blackmagic Production 4K. This camera's a little different, so it has two quarter inch microphone inputs, and these are quarter inch inputs, so it's not three and a half millimeter. You can't plug in, you know, a Rode Wireless Go into this, and you can't plug in XLR microphones into this either. Quarter inch inputs are the standard for like electric guitars and like amps and stuff like that. They're not really standard for filmmaking and audio production in this realm, so it's a little strange that they included these rather than just a three and a half millimeter input or even a mini XLR or standard size XLR. However, you can get something like this, which is a quarter inch to three and a half millimeter adapter or even a quarter inch to XLR adapter. There's a bunch of different options for changing this, but you're probably gonna wanna get some sort of adapter to any sort of standard 3.5mm or XLR inputs. However, this camera also does have a 3.5mm headphone jack, and then all of your gain settings are going to be in the menu and the touchscreen of this. So there's no physical buttons and dials for adjusting your gain or headphone output or anything like that. So a little bit less intuitive than the C100 where you can just quick turn a dial. However, the menu is pretty straightforward with this camera. And last but not least, like always, the Panasonic AF100. This camera also has two XLR microphone inputs, just like the C100. They both also have phantom power, and there's physical buttons and dials for adjusting the gain on those XLR inputs. And then this camera has a 3.5mm headphone jack, however, there's no 3.5mm microphone input. There's only the two XLR inputs on this camera, so you can't use a standard 3.5mm microphone. You're going to have to adapt anything you need into the XLR inputs. And so out of these three cameras, I would say the C100 definitely has the most options with two XLR inputs and 3.5mm inputs all the audio dials and stuff on top of the camera on the top handle. The AF100 I'd say comes in second place with two XLR inputs, still some physical buttons and dials for adjusting your audio settings. And then the Blackmagic Production 4K I'd say comes in last with the really weird not very standard inputs as well as no physical buttons for adjusting your audio. You pretty much have to dive into the menu to adjust any audio settings with this camera. And all three of these also have speakers built into them for playing back your footage and being able to hear kind of what you got in your footage. Of course, none of these speakers are good at all. However, if you do want to just at least make sure you capture audio, all three of these cameras have speakers built in for playing back your footage. And that is it for audio. All right, next up we have ISO performance. So I recorded the same shot with all these cameras at every single ISO that they do, all the way from their lowest, all the way up to the highest possible ISO you can go with all three of these cameras. Now I'm gonna show all of these going from the lowest to the highest with each of these cameras so you can see for yourself what the noise and grain looks like in each of these at each ISO. Now try to watch this part in the highest resolution possible. So if you can put it in 4K, try to do that so you can see this noise the best possible because YouTube's probably gonna compress this a bunch. And I'm not sure how useful this is gonna be for you seeing how much noise is in each of these images. However, I do have my opinion on which ISOs I think work best with each camera, so I'm gonna go over that real quick, and then I'll just go ahead and show you every single ISO with each three of these cameras. So first of all, with the C100, up to about 500 ISO, is pretty much the same amount of noise. It's obviously really good at these low ISOs and pretty much anything from the lowest up to 500 is about the same I noticed. And then between 640 and 800, it gets a little noisier, still nothing crazy, but you can definitely tell the noise is increasing. And then once you get to 850, which is the native ISO on this camera, it kind of drops the noise down a little bit from 800. However, it's still not as low of noise as 500 and lower. However, overall 850 will give you the best image possible in terms of dynamic range and everything else. However, However, I did notice it still has slightly higher noise than ISO's 500 and below, even though 850 is the native ISO on this camera. So I'm not sure if that is going to be universal or just with my testing. And then it gets slightly noisier all the way up to 2000 ISO, but still not terrible, which is really awesome in this old of a camera to have that good a noise performance. And then I noticed at 2500 ISO, it seems to clean up a little bit. Again, I don't know if this is going to be in all scenarios, but in my testing, it seems like going from 2000 up to 5000 cleans up the noise a little bit, which is really interesting. And then pretty much from 2500 to 6400, it pretty much, the noise goes up steadily. However, it's still nothing insane at that point, which is really interesting. And then once you get above 6400, it gets quite noisy and probably to the point where you don't really want to use that footage unless you use a really good denoising plugin, or if having noise in your image really isn't that big of a deal. And of course, at 20,000, which is the max ISO, the noise is going to be the highest in this camera. So in my opinion, I would stick to 2500 or below and really 
really anything 850 to 2500, you might need to add a little noise removal in post, but you can still definitely get away with it at that point. Next up, the Blackmagic Production Camera 4K. Now this camera actually only has three options in terms of ISO. You can do 200, 400, which is the native ISO, and then 800. Now with this camera, I noticed that 200 and 400 are basically the same. I really couldn't tell a difference in noise with these two ISOs. However, keeping that in mind, 400 still should overall be the best since it is the native ISO. And then 800 definitely adds quite a bit of noise, and this you're gonna need some noise reduction, or maybe just try not to use 800 ISO if you can get away with it. So with this camera, I'd recommend 200 or 400. However, if you can, stick at 400 since that's the native ISO. Next up, the Panasonic AF100. With this, I noticed that pretty much anything 320 and below is pretty good and pretty much the exact same noise performance. Now in this camera, 320 is the native ISO. However, once you pretty much go anywhere past that, like up to 400 ISO or higher, you can definitely see noise start to come in this camera. Now I'd say this camera's still usable up to 2000 ISO, you know, maybe with a little bit of noise removal in post. However, once you get past 2000 ISO, this camera really degrades the image really fast. Now I'd say this camera is still probably usable anywhere up to 2000 ISO with maybe a little bit of noise reduction in post. However, once you get to like 2500 and over, uh, it pretty much just falls apart and I wouldn't say it's usable at all. So all in all, I would say try to use all these at their native ISOs or below. And if you can get away with it, I would just stick to the native ISOs. These might not have the best noise performance overall. However, they're going to have the best performance in general in terms of dynamic range and pretty much everything else with these cameras. Alright, next up is rolling shutter. So with this, the C100 and the AF100 both have what's called a rolling shutter, and then the Blackmagic Production 4K has a global shutter. And so the C100 and AF100 both have a little bit of that like warping effect when you pan left and right, kind of like that jello-y effect. However, the Blackmagic Production 4K is not going to have any of this rolling shutter. It's going to be pretty much just a perfect non-jello effect when you're panning left and right or really doing any sort of handheld work. So overall with this, of course, the Blackmagic Production 4K is going to have the best rolling shutter performance. You know, when you see me panning left and right here, this vertical line is pretty much vertical all the way through no matter what, no matter how fast you pan left and right, which of course makes it look the most natural. I would say for second place, the AF100 definitely takes that spot. It still has a little bit of that jello effect. You can see that line is warped a little bit. And in last place comes the C100. However, it's still not terrible, not as bad as a lot of other mirrorless cameras are. And overall, I'd say all these cameras perform pretty well. However, if you really need good rolling shutter performance, you definitely can't beat a global shutter camera like the Blackmagic Production 4K. All right, on to autofocus. Now, right off the bat, I just want to say, none of these cameras have reliable autofocus. And that's definitely expected with cameras this old and with cinema cameras in general. But I just want to make that clear right off the bat. I wouldn't personally recommend using autofocus with any of these cameras. I think manual focus is definitely the way to go. So Canon actually does give you the option to upgrade to dual pixel autofocus with the C100. This is a $500 upgrade. However, a lot of used ones you can find might have this installed already. However, those are typically a little bit more expensive. Now, mine doesn't have 
have a dual pixel autofocus. And I'd say in my testing, I would trust this maybe to get focus on, you know, stationary object. However, really anything past that, I really wouldn't trust it. It is just single point autofocus in the center of the screen and it's single shot autofocus. There's no sort of continuous autofocus in this camera. And overall, I can see it kind of finds focus pretty quick. Um, but really for moving objects, this is not usable at all. However, even if you do have dual pixel autofocus upgrade, it's definitely going to be a lot more usable and it is going to be continuous autofocus. So for moving objects, you'll be able to find focus continuously. However, it's still just a fixed point in the center of the screen, I believe with that dual pixel autofocus upgrade. So that might be more usable and that's something that you might need to test out on your own. However, even with the dual pixel upgrade, I wouldn't recommend attempting to trust this camera in any sort of professional environment. With the Blackmagic Production 4K, this autofocus just is not very good. It even struggles to find focus sometimes. And this is just a center point, single shot autofocus in this camera as well. And again, I just really wouldn't recommend it. I mean, you can probably see on screen right now. Um, it kind of struggles to find focus. It takes a while. I just wouldn't trust this at all. And then same with the AF100. This camera just kind of struggles to get focus. It really takes a little while sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't even get focus at all. I just wouldn't trust this one either. Pretty much the same as the Blackmagic production camera. And all in all with autofocus, I'd say the C100 is definitely more usable than the other two cameras. I'd say the C100 definitely wins in this scenario. And especially with the dual pixel upgrade, it's definitely going to have the best autofocus out of all three of these cameras. However, Personally, I would not recommend trusting the autofocus with any of these cameras, and I'd recommend 100% just using manual focus. All right, next up is battery life. So like always, first off, I'm gonna start with the C100. So this is what the C100 battery looks like. This is actually a off brand. This is a Wasabi brand. So I did the same test with all three of these. So basically what I did is charge this battery up to 100%, set the camera to 1080p at 24 frames per second, hit record, and then just let it roll until the battery died. So the C100 with this battery, like I said, this is an off brand battery. So typically these aren't gonna last as long as genuine Canon batteries. However, I'm not really sure of the full statistics on that because I don't have a genuine Canon battery for this. However, this recorded in 1080p 24 frames per second for six hours straight. Now in real life scenarios when I've used this camera, I got away with a three to four hour shoot on one battery and the battery I don't even think was, you know, halfway yet. And it was like on and off recording. So it wasn't recording straight. And so I knew it was really good in terms of battery life, but the fact that this recorded for six hours straight absolutely blew my mind, even with a non-genuine Canon battery. Next up, the Blackmagic Production 4K. So this is a little different because this isn't actually the battery or this is not what comes with the camera. I'll get to this in just one second, but first of all, I did the exact same test. However, I recorded this 4K ProRes 422HQ at 24 frames per second, which just like all three of these tests, is kind of the standard resolution frame rate that you'd shoot with with these cameras. And this camera recorded for about 30 minutes before it actually filled up the storage. I had like a 256 gigabyte SSD in this camera and it filled it up in 30 minutes, which is crazy. However, after that 30 minutes, the battery had like 15% remaining. So it was about to die, which means it probably would have lasted for maybe 10 to 15 minutes longer. So we'll say about 45 minutes. However, the thing about the Blackmagic Production 4K is it has a built-in internal battery that you cannot change. You can't swap it out. If this camera dies, you have to let it charge before you can even start shooting again. You can't just swap the battery out like most cameras. And especially given the fact that this is from 2013. So the internal batteries on pretty much all of these are pretty worn out at this point in time because I can almost guarantee this camera would have lasted way longer than 45 minutes when it first came out. So I'm gonna blame this one on the internal battery just being really worn out. No matter what, I really just can't recommend using the internal battery on that camera because it's not like one of these where you can just swap it out and get a new one or just order new ones off Amazon when they start going bad. And so I actually, 100% of the time when I recorded this camera, used this setup right here, which is a small rig NPF battery plate a Sony NPF 970, and then just a 12 volt power cable that goes from this into the camera. So luckily this camera does have a 12 volt input on the side of the camera. So I can just kind of use this setup and get away with a lot more recording time. Now I didn't do a full test like the rest of these with this battery setup. However, from previous shoots with this camera, I can get away with about an hour on one NPF 970. So the Blackmagic Production 4K still sucks power. However, it's a lot better if you use an NPF 970 or really any other power source besides the internal battery. And the last but not least, the Panasonic AF100. This is the battery right here. So this is a genuine Panasonic battery. It's a little bit bigger than the Canon batteries. However, it's a lot lighter, which I noticed. I really don't know how old this battery is. It could be the original one from the camera in 2010. I honestly don't know because I purchased this used with the camera. However, 
I got away with three hours and 17 minutes of recording on this camera with that battery until it died, which is pretty impressive. I mean, obviously with this battery, I purchased this from Amazon. So this is a fairly new battery, like a few months old. With this battery still getting three hours and 17 minutes, while not knowing how old this is, it could have been very, very, well used. I can only imagine a brand new battery, even if it's an off-brand battery, will get a little bit more power time out of this, if not the exact same, which three hours and 17 minutes is definitely a good amount of runtime on a camera like this. And so that wraps up battery life with this. Of course, the C100 is the winner at six hours of runtime with one battery. The AF100 comes in second with a pretty good three hours and 17 minutes, still probably as much as you'd need if you have two or three batteries with you. And then the Blackmagic Production 4K comes in last place the internal battery just is not reliable for anything really. And you're gonna need an external setup like this, which of course will cost a little bit more money, but still nowhere near as good as these two cameras. All right, next up is the body features and form factors. So I'll start off with the Canon C100. This is what the camera looks like. It has a really nice ergonomic side grip, top handle. Overall, everything about this camera is just meant to be as functional as possible. So like I said, you have this side grip here that can rotate pretty much 360 degrees with a focus magnifier on it, a joystick for going through the menu, start and stop recording button, as well as an aperture dial right here. But you might actually be able to program this dial for other things as well. The side grip is pretty comfy. It's really nothing to write home about, but it's pretty comfy. It has this kind of like hand strap here to keep your hand in place. Overall, a pretty decent side grip. The top handle, pretty much same thing. It has finger grips on here, pretty comfortable to hold. It has the two XLR inputs, a record button, all the dials and buttons for the XLR inputs, as well as scratch audio microphones right here, microphone holder, and that's about it for the top handle. And then as you can see on the side here, it has a whole array of buttons and dials for pretty much changing everything you're gonna need to while filming without having to dive into the menus, which is super useful. So we have, of course, the power switch, which you can either go to the camera for recording or media for playing back your media. Focus magnifier, focus peaking, zebra waveform. Right up front here on the side for those video assists. Picture profile button to change the picture profile, white balance. Down here I have iris, ISO, and shutter speed buttons to change those. As well as of course right here, the ND filter dial. So this camera has built-in ND filters at zero, two, four, and six stops, which are super useful so you don't have to put ND filters on the front of your lens. They're just right built into the body here. It's one of my favorite features about this. It's really the thing that separates professional cinema cameras from just, you know, consumer video cameras. Now on the front here, you also have a record start stop button as well as a one shot autofocus button. And then around back, you have the menu, cancel buttons for pretty much going through the menu. Then right here is a three and a half inch partially articulating LCD screen. Now this is not a touch screen and it isn't fully articulating so you can pretty much either have it closed like this, you can bring it up for, you know, if you're looking at it from down below, but that's not super useful. Then you flip it open here and, you know, pretty much it tilts up and down in that direction as well as slightly to the side here if whatever situation, maybe you're recording vertical video, I guess you can kind of record it like that. However, it doesn't record all the way around for, you know, 180 degree, like facing yourself if you're recording yourself. And this is pretty much as much as it articulates right here. And then underneath the screen, you have the dual SD card slot, as well as just some buttons for playback, like start, stop, fast forward, as well as things like battery info display, and then selecting the different SD card slots, which is pretty useful. And in terms of ports and outputs, you have, of course, that headphone output right here on the back, a remote plug for, you know, having remote start and stop and possibly even zoom and stuff like that. A mini USB port, full-size HDMI out, and then an 8.4 volt DC input. And something I forgot about, the three and a half millimeter mic input is right on the side here as well. So this has clean HDMI output, so you can use this as a webcam or use an external recorder. And this actually outputs 8-bit 422 video through the HDMI. So instead of the 8-bit 420, which it records internally, it's gonna be 8-bit 422, which will have slightly higher color resolution. However, it's not gonna be super noticeable. It is nice to have though, if you do have an external recorder, you just have slightly better color resolution for color correcting and color grading. However, it's not gonna be higher actual resolution, like 4K or anything like that. And it's not 10 bit, so you're still gonna have some issues really pushing the colors in your editing software. However, it's just nice to know that it's still a little bit better quality if you record externally. But for the most part, that's about it. The battery goes in the back here as well. Um, there's an AV out up front here, battery release on the side, and that's pretty much it for the body features of this camera. Like I said, it's very comfortable to hold, and overall, it's pretty much built like a tank, and it's built 
to be used. You know, it's built with the filmmaker in mind to be able to change stuff really fast on the side here for solo shooting. And it's just a very, very usable camera. Next up, the Blackmagic Production 4K. So this camera is pretty much just a hunk of metal. There's no top handle, there's no side grip besides just kind of holding this right here, but it's also kind of sharp on the edges. It's just an angled, like triangular sided block of metal basically. Now it does have three quarter inch screws on top as well as of course on the bottom it has one. On the right side the SSD slot so you can fit full size two and a half inch SSDs on the side as well as a USB port for firmware updates. On the back it has a five inch touch screen which is really useful it's not super high resolution but the touch sensitivity and everything about it is really good. You can scroll through the menus it doesn't really lag that much. And for a camera that came out in 2013, you know, it really feels like a cell phone, how just easy it is to scroll through the touchscreen, use the menus and all that sort of stuff. So that is really nice. The screen's also fairly bright. It's nothing crazy, but for a five inch touchscreen on the back of this camera, it's pretty nice. Now around the touchscreen, you have your iris button, your focus button, as well as just a couple other buttons on the bottom for, you know, skipping through footage. The skip forward and skip back buttons are used for adjusting your aperture and your lens. Of course, your menu button to go into the menus, your record button and your power button. There's also a record button up front here. So if you do record it like this, you can press it with your finger. It's actually in a pretty good spot, but it's still just not that comfortable to hold like this. And last but not least, on the left side here, you have a bunch of ports going all down the side. So you have a remote port for a remote start and stop, a three and a half inch headphone output, the two quarter inch audio inputs, SDI output, which I'll talk about that in just a second. You have a Thunderbolt port, which Probably isn't super useful nowadays, however, it's pretty much used for uh, outputting data from the camera. And then a power input, which accepts anything from 12 to 30 volts. So this SDI output is 6G SDI and outputs 10-bit 422 clean HDMI output to an external recorder or, you know, if you want to live stream with this or anything like that. It's clean video. However, there's no HDMI output, which is a lot more standard for more consumer stuff. However, the SDI is a much more professional port. Having the 6G SDI with 10-bit 422 output is really good if you have an external SDI recorder for this, or even just an SDI monitor or anything like that. And this camera also doesn't have any sort of built-in ND filters. This is the only out of the three that doesn't have built-in ND filters, so that's one more thing to keep in mind with this camera. And last but not least, the Panasonic AF100. So this camera is very similar to the C100 in terms of, you know, all of its buttons and dials and ports and stuff. However, this has a fully articulating three and a half inch screen, also not a touch screen, but it is fully articulating. So as you can see, it's pointing forward now, you can point it backwards, you can point out like this on the side of the camera. It's pretty much like any sort of new Sony or Canon camera, DSLR or mirrorless camera screen. However, again, it's pretty low resolution. It's not super bright. And overall, I'd probably recommend an external monitor with all these cameras. However, it's good to know that this is fully articulating, unlike the C100 and the Blackmagic. Now this camera also has clear two, four, and six stop ND filters, just like the C100. It has two XLR inputs with phantom power. Also, I forgot to mention that C100 and this camera both have electronic viewfinders, but the Blackmagic doesn't. The C100 is fixed. This one is articulating up and down, which is pretty nice. It has dual SD card slots. It has a bunch of buttons and stuff on the side. Almost the same type of stuff as the C100, just kind of in different spots. So you have your waveform, zebra, optical image stabilization button to turn that on and off if your lens supports it. Your XLR audio options right here for phantom power and whatnot. Your white balance and ISO settings, custom buttons, pretty much the same type of stuff as the C100. However, your aperture dial is on the side here rather than on the handle like the C100 has. So this doesn't have any dials or anything on the side handle. Then of course you have the top handle, but this doesn't have a record button or anything on it. There's no electronics on this top handle besides just a cold shoe. You have a start and stop button on the side here along with your playback controls for, you know, playing back your video. Now on the side here for when you're holding on to the side grip, there's a start and stop button as well as another customizable user button. On the back, you have your slot select to select, you know, one of the two card slots for recording to, as well as a shutter and frame rate dial right here. So it's kind of separated from the other dials up here, um, just on the back by the battery. Of course, you have your battery on the back here as well, just like the C100. And then you have all of your outputs right here. So this camera actually has AV output. I'm sure you haven't seen that in a long time since you used a Wii or a PlayStation 2 or whatever. It's that red, yellow, and white AV outputs, which is really interesting. Of course, very, very outdated now. 
but this did come out in 2010, so it's kind of understandable. Also has a mini USB port, as well as a full-size HDMI output. And this also outputs clean HDMI for an external recorder or, you know, a webcam or something like that. However, this just outputs 8-bit 420, so it's gonna be your standard video, just like what you'd record internally outputted, but it still is clean HDMI, so there's not gonna be menus on the screen or anything like that. However, this also has an SDI output, so this has HDMI, SDI, and AV outputs, so a lot of options for outputting video, as well as a headphone jack, a remote port, and then an index port, which I'm not exactly sure what that's used for. On the bottom, you have a quarter inch and a three eighth inch tripod screws, and that is pretty much it for the body of this camera. Very similar to the C100, just kind of everything is in a little bit of a different spot, but this almost has the exact same features as the C100. However, the ergonomics just aren't quite as good at this. This handle's kind of stuck like this, so you have to hold it like a camcorder. It's not articulating at all. And the top handle just isn't quite as comfortable as the C100s. So everything about this is really similar to the C100. However, everything is still really usable with this camera if you get used to it. And it definitely has pretty much most of the features you're gonna need. One more thing I forgot to mention is that none of these cameras have any sort of wireless video outputs. So for example, with new Sony and Canon cameras, they have their dedicated apps you can use. And essentially you can get a full wireless video feed to your cell phone or tablet or whatever you use. And so with my a7S III, I use it a lot. However, all three of these cameras are pretty old. They're all from around 2010 to 2013. And so it's understandable that you can't connect an app to them because, you know, that just really wasn't around back then. However, with all three of these, I've been using the Shimble 600S wireless video transmitters. And I actually have it set up right here with my A7S III. And so it's essentially a video transmitter and receiver. They have HDMI input as well as SDI input and output on both the transmitter and receiver. And overall, just having a setup like this where you connect it to your monitor, you can even get the Shimble app on your phone and it'll transmit from the transmitter to your phone and then you can view it on your phone or iPad or whatever as well. So depending on who wants to see what your footage looks like on set at the time, you know, whether it be your talent or director or anything like that, you can output to, you know, two different things at once or just one thing like this. Someone can hold this monitor here without having to look over your shoulder at your screen on your camera. And overall, this is super nice. It's not as simple as, you know, just downloading an app on your phone and connecting it right to your camera. However, with these older cinema cameras, and really most cinema cameras in general, they really don't have super good Wi-Fi connectivity to your devices. And so this system is kind of my workaround for that. And I did use this system on my last music video shoot that I did, and it worked pretty awesome. I really have no complaints with it. You can go pretty much anywhere in the room, even like to different rooms in the house. I think it's a couple hundred foot distance you can go with these. So pretty much anywhere anybody is on set that needs to view the footage wirelessly, these are perfect for that. So I just wanted to bring that up real quick. There's no wireless connectivity with these. However, this is kind of the workaround I use. I will link this down in the description if you want to check it out. There's a bunch of different options out there, so don't feel like you have to go with the shimbal. But this is the one I use. It's pretty cheap and it's worked great for me. But either way, let's move on to the next section. All right, next up is direct footage comparisons between these cameras. So with all these cameras I shot in their highest resolution at 24 frames per second with 5600 white balance on all of them. I shot the C100 and the Blackmagic Production 4K in their log formats. And then the AF100 in user profile six, I believe, which is a little bit more flat, a little bit more cinematic than a standard profile. I used Film Convert to grade all these and try to match them up as good as possible. However, I'm not a professional color grader or colorist at all. And with a lot more practice, you can do a much better job than me. However, I just try to match them up as best as I could. And then in terms of lenses, I tried to match up the focal lengths pretty good. And most of the time they were stopped down to like f2.8 or f4. So the lens sharpness shouldn't be a very big factor. And so on the C100, I used a Sigma Art 35 millimeter lens. On the Blackmagic Production 4K, I used a Sigma R 18 to 35 at around like 30 millimeters to try to make it equivalent to the C100s with its slightly more cropped in crop factor. And then on the Panasonic AF100, I used a Panasonic 20 millimeter F1.7. And so all these are kind of around a 40 to 50 something millimeter full frame equivalent. I couldn't get everything identical or use the exact same lenses in all these. However, I got as close as I could and overall, lens sharpness and performance isn't gonna be a super huge factor, but it might still play a slight factor in these, so keep that in mind. 
right, if you made it this far in the video, please go leave a comment down below because this is probably a ridiculously long video. But it's finally time to give my recommendations and crown the king of the thousand dollar cinema cameras. So out of these three cameras and really any true cinema camera that you can get for less than a thousand dollars, I would say the best option overall in general is the Canon C100. The ergonomics of this camera, just how it feels in your hand is amazing. All the different options you have for recording, for audio, for buttons, dials, everything with this camera is pretty much perfect. And I'm gonna crown this camera the king of the $1,000 cinema cameras. However, I think this camera is best used for running gun work, documentary work, something where you don't have as much time to set up lighting. This camera is great for just running around and just filming what you need to. And so I might be biased because that's mostly the type of video that I do. So I wanna keep that in mind. I could be biased in that sense. However, if you're doing filmmaking, if you wanna do you know, story-based filmmaking, something where every single shot in your film, you're gonna set the lighting for, you're gonna pretty much tune it exactly how you need it to be. I think the best option is the Blackmagic Production 4K. This camera has amazing codex to work with for color grading and getting your film to look exactly how you want it. And this camera just has that cinematic look to it. Something about it, it just looks really good. And I would say if you're doing story-based filmmaking where you have a lot more time for each of the shots to set up exactly how you need it to, you know, you have a professional colorist working with the footage, I think this camera will give you the best overall image, as well as the most cinematic movie-like image out of these three cameras. And then for the AF100, I think it just mostly falls short in everything that these other two cameras can do. And it's still a great camera. I want to reiterate that all three of these cameras, you can create amazing looking images. I'm not a pro with any of these cameras and with anything I do. So if with a lot of practice, you can get way better looking images than I could get out of these. And these are all viable options for cinema cameras. However, everything is going to be based on your personal scenario. If some of the features in the AF100 best fit you and the other ones don't, it's an amazing camera. You can get awesome looking footage out of this camera. But personally, in my opinion, my possibly biased opinion, I would say the C100 is the best overall option for a true cinema camera for less than $1,000. But that wraps this video up. Thank you so much for watching this entire video. Again, please go down and hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, maybe share this or something like that. If you wanna help my channel out, I would really, really appreciate it. But that's it for me. I'll see you in the next video.